Thank you. Welcome back. It's nice to see you today. Uh, I'm Andrew Rand, once again, Chairman of the Peoria County Board. And I'm here to lead off this week's uh, communications effort with our area media sources. And thank you again for being here. Uh, today, you'll be hearing from the director of our public health department, Monica Henriksen, as well as the CEO for Heartland Health Services, our local, <coughs> excuse me, federally, federally qualified health center. Uh, welcome, good to see you, Sharon. Yesterday, the federal government issued a modified directive that all of us in this country should shelter at least until the end of April. Sobering as this edict may be about the seriousness and the growing uh, public health crises in our country, the government offered little comfort in the news broadcast to many of us who may have already started to feel an increased anxiety about knowing when this will ever end. We understand this too. Last week, the president signed a relief bill for Americans that promises to bring some temporary financial relief to households and businesses alike. We all know that this won't be enough and will still require everyone to conserve, to economize, and to redouble our efforts to find others in our apartment complexes, our developments, and our neighborhoods who may need additional help. We know it's difficult not understanding when we're gonna to get to go back to work, visit our loved ones, or get the world back the way it was before COVID-19. And my best advice comes from a friend who once told me long ago when I was seemingly overwhelmed by a problem that the way you go about eating an elephant is one bite at a time. And I would say that those that are feeling overwhelmed, that you can do this one day, one week at a time. And while each day may bring a challenge that can be met, remember we're all in this together we'll all get to the finish line on the same day when this is over. And for goodness sake, if you need help, ask for it. These are very normal feelings to have and know that you're not alone in having them. Know that your efforts to stay home, and to maintain a social distance from one another, those are all the right courses of action. And we, we still need everyone to continue doing their part. And once again, if you need to talk to someone, ask for help. Dial 211 or call 309-999-4029, and those uh, operators will help get you connected to the referral sources that can help you, whether it's a financial question or you simply need to talk to somebody or you'd like to see a doctor. Locally, <clears throat> I also have complete confidence in our operations team and our health department administrator, Monica Henriksen. She and her uh, teams have given us consistent guidance on this pandemic and the steps we should all be taking. And please, of course, remember to watch our continued briefings as this crisis moves along. I was moved somewhat today by an article over the weekend in the newspaper that suggested that we were not uh, being forthright or completely transparent with the media. And to that end, I'd be happy to answer questions later about that. I was always taught in mathematics that it's difficult to draw a line with one data point. And I think when you attempt to draw a line around one data point <clears throat> and you don't really help others understand what that one data point means, um, false pictures can develop. And I'd like to say uh, for certain that all of us that understand the public health department's perspectives on reporting understand we're trying to report the most important parts of the story so that all of us can behave and act in responsible ways. It's that simple. And all of us have tremendous uh, fondness and support and appreciation for our next speaker, uh, Public Health Executive, Monica. Thank you, Chairman Rand. We began this briefing um, by reporting on our cases for the Tri-County region. The confirmed cases for Peoria remains at seven. 
one of which, the new case over the weekend, was our first community transmission in Peoria County. Woodford is at four. Um, at the time of this uh, data point, we do understand just about a few minutes ago they are reporting their fifth case. That will be counted in tomorrow's numbers. And that Tazewell County is also at four. One of the other data points that went live today is our hospital systems reporting in terms of their hospitalization and ICU. This is a data point that the Illinois Department of Public Health had started requesting from our hospital systems, and with our first day of reporting being today, we're able to share that information. Please be aware, though, the numbers reflected by the hospital systems do not necessarily overlap with the tri-county residents. Our healthcare system is large and is um, within the state of Illinois, one of our largest systems, uh, seeing patients from throughout not only our state, but even from other states. So with that, there are currently four persons under investigation in the ICUs of the four hospital system. There are three confirmed cases of COVID in the ICU. There were nine positive tests in the past 24 hours, and there were seven specimens collected in the past 24 hours. The four hospitals include OSF St. Francis Medical Center, UniPoint Health Methodist, UniPoint Health Proctor, and UniPoint Health Pekin. In addition, the state released today 461 new cases, bringing the count to 52 counties out of 102 that are now reporting confirmed cases of residents. You may also start seeing changes at grocery stores. The Illinois Department of Public Health and the governor's office release grocery store guidance to our essential services that are our grocery stores and obtaining ways to create additional prevention actions within their facilities. Different things include really focusing on how to maintain that six foot separation distance, whether it is creating visual reminders, uh, having staff monitor, as well as reminders through the PA systems. As you go through the grocery stores in the next few days, if you don't choose to do curbside pickup or online, which is a preferred method, you'll be aware of these changes as they come through. We spend a lot of time talking about some of our largest healthcare systems in our community, OSS St. Francis and UniPoint Health. But one of the greatest things that we have in a community is that we have a very strong federally qualified health center. And to speak about the services they provide to some of our most vulnerable population, I am actually honored to present uh, Sharon Adams, the CEO of Heartland Health Services. Thank you, Monica. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pl uh, pleased to be here. Uh, Heartland has been mentioned several times over the course of these um, news media, so I am pleased to be here to tell you a little bit more about Heartland Health Services. We are indeed a federally qualified health center. So what that means is that we partner with the, the government to be able to provide services to everyone, regardless of their ability to pay. We also partner with both health systems in town and uh, most of the not-for-profits in town as well. We have been in the community almost 30 years. Our first clinic was a volunteer clinic, and we have grown to where we are today. We currently have eight medical clinics, uh, six in Peoria, two in Pekin. Our uh, clinics in uh, Peoria are located in those areas of the community where we can uh, provide accessibility to the community that needs us. We are on the south side, we are uh, in the East Bluff, we are downtown, and we even have a clinic here at the Peoria City County Health Department. Of course, that is closed right now, uh, but we will open again just as soon as we can. We also have two clinics in Pekin. We provide many, many services, uh, so I appreciate being here today to share some of those with you. Of course, we do primary care, including pediatrics. We do pe behavioral health, podiatry, pulmonology, sports medicine, women's health with OB, ophthalmology. We also do medication-assisted therapy. This is assistance with uh, individuals who uh, might have a drug addiction and want help 
with that. We have walk-in clinic, and we also, at one of our offices, there is a dental clinic that we partner with OSF for. And then in Pekin, we have a primary care office and a women's health uh, office with OB. So you can see we do a lot of different things. We also have a lot of bilingual uh, employees for the Spanish-speaking population. And we also have translation services for a lot of different other uh, languages as well. One of the uh, departments that we have is of great benefit to the community and surrounding areas is our outreach and enrollment department. This is a group of individuals, employees, who also help patients in the community with those things not directly related with physical health, but those things that affect it. For example, they help with housing, food, uh, acquiring their medications, uh, transportation to their physician appointments. They are also certified application uh, counselors. That means they can uh, enroll people in the marketplace, in Medicare, in Medicaid, financial assistance. And now with uh, the situation we're in now, they can help people that may lose insurance coverage to help them uh, gain some uh, medical coverage. Regarding COVID-19, we work very closely with the health department here, with the government, with our own uh, national and Illinois uh, uh, national organizations and Illinois organizations that work with FQHCs to make sure that we're following the requirements on testing, uh, of, of personal protective equipment, cleaning of the offices, et cetera. We take every precaution for our staff and our patients. Uh, today was our first day with a mobile van. We're in working in partnership with a Unity Point and Methodist for use of their mobile van. We're going out to five shelters in town. We went to two today, uh, and it's going very well. We'll be going four days a week to the shelters. And also, we're working very hard. We just had a meeting this morning to get telehealth implemented. And we hope to have that in the next few days. So we are here to serve the community in any way we can. We please uh, encourage you to reach out to us. If there's something we can't do, we will get you in contact with somebody who can help you. You can contact us by calling 309 Six eight zero seven six zero zero, or has that has been mentioned here before? Call two one one. We work very closely with them. They know us very well. They refer a lot of people to us, and we appreciate that. We're also out on social media, Facebook and Twitter. Right now, we have some uh, uh, film uh, or some footage of our one of our behavioral health. Uh, providers uh, on how to deal with anxiety during this time. So, uh, so there's some good information we post daily, so I encourage you to get out there and watch for us on so social media. And on a side note, I just want to say this is National Doctors' Day today, so I just want to thank all the providers out there in the community that are working so hard during this difficult time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Um, we'll open up to questions along with Sharon, myself, and uh, Chairman Rand. We also have a county administrator, Scott Sorrell, and Dr. Stoner, who is the uh, medical director for not only the Peoria City County Health Department, but also the chief medical officer for Heartland Health Services. If individuals um, from our area were tested and um, received a positive test result, then yes, we would be notified as a local health department. Uh, and then based on that information, we began uh, contacting them, letting them understand what their test means, giving them guidance on isolation, as well as contact tracing for those involved. Are you the one who tells them that? I mean, how quickly do they get their results over there? 
It depends on how fast the turnaround time is for the, the test results. Uh, right now, the state lab is anywhere from uh, 24 to 48 hours turnaround time. Uh, some private labs, if they're utilizing a private lab, could be longer. If they are getting the results within um, a few days, then it is notified through their resident local health departments uh, that they're a resident of. So if they are a Peoria County resident, they should expect a phone call from the Peoria City County Health Department. Likewise, for Woodford County, it would be the Woodford County Health Department. And then from Tazewell, it would be Tazewell County Health Department. So it'll be possibly a week before we start seeing those, if there are any? It might be um, sooner than that, hopefully. But yes, it should start rolling in. Um, I believe they had wanted to do about 250 total. I do believe that they were shy of both on both days that they were having those events. I don't think they actually hit 100 on either one of those days. And will this continue for how long? The testing yeah, at McLean House? I know it was supposed to go on, and they didn't say when it was going to end. I, I think they're going to try to keep testing until they run out of tests themselves. Um, they had set up a kind of a threshold value, and until they run out of that, they will continue operating. Now, again, these are federal assets. These are coming from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, as well as HHS. Um, they are not state or local assets, so it's really dependent on them. So you mentioned there were four uh, patients in ICU currently, is that correct? Um, there are four persons under investigation that are in the ICU in the four hospitals. Uh, persons under investigation are individuals that are demonstrating symptoms, might have been uh, connected to a contact or had a travel history, but do not have a confirmed test yet. They are, uh, in, because of other uh, decisions that the hospital systems made in terms of um, kind of changing some of their non-essential services that they were offering, they're actually at some of their lowest capacity right now. Um, again, preparing for that possible surge that might come in the next few, uh, few weeks. And so with that, the hospitals have been daily monitoring their capacity, understanding what their limits are, and then recognizing the fact that a lot of things they've done has actually helped kind of keep that um, lower than it would have been a year ago. Is it possible to put a percentage or a number on the current capacity at the, at the hospitals? Um, we are working on that, and the reason why I can't give a strong answer on that is because they are actually looking at how they do ICU capacity in general. Um, you've seen this in the New York area where they're converting uh, vet machines or uh, anesthesiology machines to help uh, facilitate this. So both hospitals are actually looking to expand their capacity right now. So what they would be normally built for a year ago, they're trying to expand that right now as we speak. Do we, do we feel we're adequately prepared at this time for a potential surge in a few weeks? I mean, the current projections show we're, we're expected probably sometime April, maybe, for, for when we start really getting a crunch here in Illinois on uh, ICU capacity. I mean, do we feel like we're ready locally? I think we are very much ready locally in the terms of the planning and communication that has been done by our hospital systems and our healthcare system in general. Whether it's not just the hospitals, the EMS providers, Heartland Health Services, the nurse triage program, all of those were put into place to really keep our capacity at bay. I think the um, kind of the missing part in this conversation is understanding how well we've decreased transmission through that stay at home or shelter in place. As long as that intervention that we are all participating in and we do well, then yes, I think our capacity is something that we can keep, uh, we're in a good planning pay phase for right now. But part of that is that we are planning for the unknown, and so that's always going to be the moving target for us. So would you say Central wants to do a good job of flattening that curve out right now to a point where it's, it's manageable? I think it's too early to tell for flattening, but for today, we're in, within our capacity, and we're able to respond to the needs today. You said there were five cases in Woodford confirmed? So there were, um, when the data was run uh, today that was submitted for our report, there was four, but they were just announced a fifth case. Um, they're currently investigating it. It just came in about five minutes before we went on air. Governor, well, Governor Pritzker uh, said, that, said yesterday that he wants to have 10,000 tests per day within 10 days in Illinois. How many would be here in this area? And I think the, what the governor is requesting is a, a noble request to have that much testing capacity here locally. What's really difficult is understanding that even with 10,000 tests, we would still have to prioritize as a state. And so really that prioritization will still based on people that are showing symptoms, 
Um, and then again, those who wear the testing would actually matter or change their course of care. Uh, I think if you look from a population standpoint, our region and our hospital system serve outside the Chicagoland area, one of the largest healthcare communities and a large population base. Um, having said that though, that ratio of understanding symptomatic versus non is what really is a missing piece for that. Monica, the governor mentioned in his press conference today about different shipments of PPE and kind of where they were going across the state. And he did mention the Peoria area. Can you talk about how, to, how that split up you know, within this area about what hospitals get what? So the question is about PPE and how that kind of comes down locally to other entities. So there's actually two mechanisms in which uh, personal protective equipment or PPE is um, brought into a community. One is through your Illinois Department of Public Health or local health departments. The other is through your IEMA or Illinois Emergency Management Agency. Depending on the entity, they will filter up either through the health department, through a hospital system, and then lastly through IEMA as kind of the one and done aspect. So with that locally, one of the greatest private partnerships that we've actually have that comes through this um, entire emergency operations that we've done here locally in Peoria has been working with uh, TADA that's helped us bridge distribution needs and burn ratios about material for our entire community. Uh, people that are way smarter than me, um, that understand the logistics and computers, were able to really match the need versus the ask. And with that, we here locally have been able to ask for uh, shipments to come in. And to date, um, not only the health department, but the uh, hospital systems and the IE, Illinois Emergency Management Agency have received their shipments and are currently distributing it to all those that have requested it. The issue, of course, will maintain that no one will get 100% of what they requested for. And that allocation really comes to understanding that how much can we give out in a week's worth of time and continue to do that while we are still trying to back in more supplies that comes in. So then if you could talk about kind of the balancing act that has to occur between saving some of the stuff that we get for, you know, this potential peak that, you know, experts are saying could come sometime mid-April versus using a lot of gear now in order to keep them safe ahead of time. You know, we've had nurses, people reach out to us saying, you know, we're not getting, you know, face shields, you know, how, talk about that balancing act. So the balancing act of understanding supply and how you kind of extend that supply is a really um, precarious balance. And that's one that's actually done within those entities. Um, our role here as a health department and the emergency management agency is to get the request and push it out and really understand that each department that's requesting material is gonna be best suited to understand their needs as well as how they can extend it. And so there's a lot of guidance that came from the Illinois Department of Public Health as well as the CDC or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in terms of extending the shelf life or the usage of a lot of their PPE. And so with that, um, a lot of our healthcare providers, whether it's our EMS providers, law enforcement, uh, our hospital systems are taking in the stock that they requested and really looking at how they are trying to control their distribution of it as well. That happens by each entity, not by the local health department or the IEMA. We're just pushing out whatever we get in as fast as we can. And uh, Monica, I understand a, uh, a waiver recently went into effect with people in the WIC program regarding milk. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that is and what that means for people locally here. I uh, Thank you for bringing that up. It's actually been a great thing as a waiver that was received by the WIC program. So the USDA, which oversees our WIC programs throughout states, issued a waiver that allows individuals to um, gain um, product, whether it is whole milk or reduced fat milk, but not necessarily match what was required on their coupon. And this, again, goes to the supply issues that we're seeing. If individuals are over-purchasing items that are WIC approved, then um, previously they weren't able to necessarily go and trade something or substitute. This waiver allows families and grocery stores and those that take WIC to accept those substitutions. So those mothers and children are able to get the nutri nutrition that they need. And are, is there claims in the works for any other food, like you know, bread, cereal, like we brought all these up before, is other things that you know, WIC's having some trouble with, right? Are people with WIC having trouble with protein right now? Is there anything else going on with that? Yeah, so in terms of other products might also be receive waivers. Um, the WIC program is looking into it. Milk was the first foremost one, and the, the biggest need. And then from there, they're kind of working their way through each product line to make sure that there is an adequate substitution that meets the nutritional needs of that family, as well as the demand and supply exists. I have a question for the uh, county administrator. Okay, 
we will ask Scott to come in. Okay. I have one quick question for you. Last week you said that we have one person that was diagnosed um, who is getting better now and mm -hmm. going, going home. How, how is this person determined to be better? You know, what, what are the key elements of that? And then what kind of instruction are they given after their release? So the question is about the individual that um, is in recovery. So this individual is actually first has always been at home. They were never hospitalized, um, so that was, uh, you know, a good thing. And most of our cases are at home recovering. So there's two ways that Illinois Department of Public Health is looking to when someone is considered recovered. One is testing, that a test comes back negative. But again, mentioning the fact that we have a lack of testing and supplies, we want to prioritize testing for diagnostics, not necessarily for the recovery standpoint. So really, they're looking at it from a symptom standpoint. And our healthcare uh, providers have all changed their guidance um, when they do discharge or aftercare summaries to help educate individuals that have suspect or presumptive COVID as well in the fact that you will still stay in isolation at home. And depending on your symptoms, from the day of onset, it is seven days post your onset of symptoms and or through 72 hours without a fever. So it's a little bit confusing, but it's the longest time period. So for example, if I developed symptoms on the first, and I was on the second, my fever broke, and 72 hours later, three days later on the fifth, I was still without a fever, then really from the first seven days out, which would be the eighth, I would be considered out of isolation and under recovery. Now, come the eighth, if I'm still under a fever, then I still would not be out of isolation, it takes me another four days to get break my fever. It'll be three days after that. So really, it could be up to 14 days. So whichever is the longest time period. Um, the Illinois Department of Public Health has a very good graphic to explain this. Um, but really, it's understanding that it's going to be based without universal testing. It's going to be based a lot more on symptomology. And when your fever breaks, as well as when you have improved symptoms, uh, the cough, soreness, uh, uh, sore throat, as well as shortness of breath. Yes, or it changes um, the clinical care that you would receive. Again, majority of individuals, 80% who receive who get COVID, will be have mild symptoms and be able to stay at home, take fever-reducing medication, rest and fluid. But there is that 20% that have comorbidities or make themselves high risk. So understanding that they have COVID would change probably their care model in terms of the higher need for critical care for them. And so based on that, we really are focusing testing on that high vulnerable population. Yeah. Thanks, Monica. Uh, who asked the question on what was it? I was standing out in the hallway to keep our numbers under 10, so. No, you're fine, didn't uh, even ask it yet. So, you know, speaking of that, you know, obviously the county making huge measures to obviously limit the spread of, you know, COVID-19, all during our part social distancing. But we have county employees, for example, the highway department employees complaining that, you know, they're having to ride in trucks with other people. So obviously that's not six feet apart and that their employer is basically saying, well, if you don't do your job, you'll lose it. So I, you know, kind of what's that balance with, you know, you're an essential employee, but yet you can't. Right. So I, I first I would say that uh, we're not forcing any Peoria County team member uh, to put themselves in an uncomfortable position such as that. Uh, and if that is occurring, uh, it'll, uh, we'll work with the department heads and elected officials to bring that to my attention and resolve it. Um, uh, but as we move forward, uh, what we are doing as, uh, as an employer, as a unit of government, uh, is putting in place measures that all employers should be putting in place, and that is uh, trying to ensure that uh, we are enforcing and practicing those social distancing uh, guidelines. Uh, I think this is a, is a unique situation that uh, we'll certainly uh, investigate and, and determine what the proper course of action is going forward. Yeah, because I guess if you could, you know, elaborate a little more, because obviously, you know, this is the essential thing that they're doing, but kind of that balance of, you know, because if then they all get sick, then, you know, we right. don't have that service. So what, uh, Many of the things that, a couple of things that we've done already is uh, we have uh, the ability if, if team members are, are uh, either 
uh, symptomatic, we obviously want them to stay home. Uh, if uh, they uh, have childcare needs, uh, we want them to stay home. Uh, if uh, they are uncomfortable in our workplace, uh, even if they are an essential uh, service uh, department, uh, we've got procedures in place where they can uh, be excused from uh, from coming into work. So it's a function. And those have been very well communicated to all of our team members. Uh, I actually send out a daily email that includes some of that very information uh, to all of our team members. And so I think it's a function of all of our, all of our folks uh, really taking to heart some of that guidance that we're giving them. Well, as of right now, I would characterize Peoria County government as being very united uh, and uh, all of us working uh, very hard to continue delivering uh, services to the taxpayers of Peoria County uh, while uh, working within the constraints that we have under this new normal. So in terms of uh, what penalty would possibly be there, you know, uh, we're not in a position today because I'm just actually learning about it a little bit uh, right before uh, we came on air. Uh, so I've got a, a little bit more work uh, to do in terms of investigating what the situation is. And uh, once I know more about the situation, then I'll be able to take corrective action as the administrator if there is any to be taken. So one of the services that you talked about that Heartland have, has is looking at kind of addiction services with mm -hmm. medication, things of that nature. Obviously right now is a, definitely a difficult time for people struggling with addiction since a lot of the things that they would access, you know, things like meetings, things of that nature can't happen. So can you discuss what services are still available despite kind of the social distancing? So we, we are still continuing with our medication assisted therapy, our uh, appointments there. We're also this week going to be moving to, um, with our behavioral health providers, telephone calls. So people don't have to come in. They can uh, do voice-to-voice um, uh, 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 -voice with the behavioral um, um, provider. And so we're looking at ways. We also try to social distance in the office um, as well uh, to keep people safe. But it is, as you said, it's very important right now, especially that uh, the behavioral health component of all a person's well-being is very important right now, and we are concentrating on that. So, so I know today was one of the first days of it where the vans actually mm -hmm. went out, but mm -hmm. any idea as to be able to quantify the number of people you're going to be able to serve uh, with this new service? So we're going to the shelters, so five shelters um, in a week's time, some, some of them multiple times. Uh, today, just in our trial run, we saw five patients this morning and five this afternoon. So we hope to grow that uh, as we get better. This was our first time treating on a mobile van. So uh, uh, we're very excited, very excited about it to grow it. So uh, we want to go where we're needed, and the shelters is one place where we're needed. So. are not any more questions, then we will see you guys again here tomorrow at 3.30. Thank you.